I don't know the title it. I have several names, but I'm calling it the Father Wound. Uh, the series of Unmasking the Lie, we're kind of unmasked a lie today. Um, the sermon's going to be completely different because I've got part one, and part two and part three are shared by David and Shelly. Okay? So you get to hear from three different perspectives on the on this sermon. Now, these three parts, they may connect beautifully. They may not connect. But the issue on our hearts is, is how do we get a church? How do we get Christians? Most of us who do not have a good relationship with our parents or an all parent relationship with our parents are because here's the deal. I don't know, if I talk to the parents, they will give me one version of the family life, right? Mm -hmm. And then I go listen to their kid. The kid will give me something completely different. It's, it's so amazing to listen to generations because one's perspective can be the opposite of another one's perspective. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the, the father wound. So here's the deal. How do we, remember I'm talking about lately they've been praying, you know, if you're not in love with Jesus, we'll pray it. Jesus, teach me what it means to be in love with you. Teach me. Lord, I don't know what it means to be in the Spirit. Lord, teach me how to be in the Spirit. Teach me how to see in the Spirit. Because there's some things I can teach you all about, but there's some things that God's just got to do within you, with Himself, and make these things happen because I can't always undo. I might be able to show you the past, show you what's happened, but at the end of the day, what it comes to is we take off as much junk as we can, but the transformation, that connection, is a spiritual, supernatural change. It truly is. It truly is. Now, with that being said, <laughs> Megan and I were talking this week. I don't know what they. Oh, was it? Yeah, it's Friday. Yeah. Yeah, it's Friday. And uh, we were talking about different things and different people that we have in common, more than one. And she goes, when are these 18-year-old 21-year-old, 27-year-old, and I added 30, 40, 50, and 60-year-old men, okay, boys going to grow up and be men. Amen. 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 How is it that an 18-year-old is, is not a grown man anymore? Or a 21-year-old, or a 27-year-old, or a 50-year-old? Man, we're messing up in our society somewhere. We're messing up in the church somewhere. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So my part of this sermon is going to be brief. As brief as I can be. But Megan and I are in agreement. Now, I was on a flight from Norfolk, Virginia to uh, San Diego, California. On a military flight. And one of these young ladies that worked for me, she was from West Virginia. And so, since we were sitting there and she's a seat next to me, we're just cutting up. And she started telling me West Virginia jokes. You, know, <laughs> you can never come up with a uh, West Virginia joke worse than she did. Some of them I cannot repeat in church, okay? But there's one that I can repeat. She asked me, hey, Jeff, what's the most confusing day in West Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, I was dumb to where she was going. I said, I don't know. What? She goes, Father's Day. <laughs> most confusing day. She goes, none of us know where a real father is. You know, it's probably our uncle or our grandfather or, you know, she was making a joke out of that part. But it was really funny, but it hit me when she said that that is the most confusing day in America. Because a lot of us don't know who our fathers are. And a lot of us, we know them by name. We know them by picture, but we never have them. The most confusing day in America is Father's Day. You know, whose name is on the birth certificate may not be the father that raises you, that loves you. Some of us, like Forrest, our, our fathers were taken from us when we were young. We grew up without our biological father. Some of us growing up, and all kind of, we had many different fathers. My mom was married four times. I don't think any of them lasted more than uh, six months. So they weren't really, I never saw them as fathers. But anyway, most confusion in America. Now, as a church, we've been talking about healing a lot. Because for this church to do, this church is called to be and to do, it requires a bunch of people, us, as a group, 
to understand how this God works in the spirit to heal, to change, to transform. Sometimes that battle, that fight is uh, uh, physical. You've been physically abused. Sometimes it's emotional. You've been emotionally abused. Sometimes it's just spiritual. Because of the abuse, when you look at God, you can't see God as God the Father because you never had a father. You can't see God as God the Father because your father abused you, walked out on you, left you, rejected you, threw you away. And so when you got to do a sermon in church, you know, and the, the, the advantage I think we have is we don't have to play the game. We can just be real. So we're going to be real with that, okay? Okay? Is that good? Okay. So we're going to deal with the other side rather than every father is perfect. Now here's the deal. I never had a father, but I had a lot of fathers. And a lot of people I looked at and I respected. And there were qualities I admired in them. And you know, so that become my spiritual fathers. Okay? <laughs> we all get that. Now here's the deal. In our society, <coughs> well, in church we talk about healing, transformation. We talk about it's a spiritual warfare, you know. We talk about living in the spirit, and that sounds good every time I preach a sermon, right? But when you leave, I wonder, said, who actually got that? Who actually knows how to fight in the spirit? Who actually knows how to live in the spirit? Or did you just hear the words? Because that's what typically happens. Because when we go to connect the dots in our mind to our own lives, we can't connect the dots, can't even see the dots. I mean, how many sermons can I do on spiritual warfare before a person will actually stand up in their Christianity, in their being saved with the Holy Spirit in you? At what point do you actually stand and fight in the Holy Spirit? And realize your enemy is not your wife or your past, your mom and your daddy, but your enemy is actually you. Because you will take that next step and praise God. You will take that next step and let it go. You will take that next step and fight for what's real. You won't let you won't choose what God says about you. You will let it sit there and do nothing and die in your depression, in your anxiety, and be disconnected the rest of your Christian walk and live in church for the next 50 years and have zero show for. I can't fight for you. I can fight with you, side by side. But until a person makes that choice to heal, you know what we've done? You not only tied the pastor's hands, you've tied the Holy Spirit's hands, God's hands. Let me listen to my sermon. <laughs> now, <coughs> There's two things that complicate being a child. <laughs> One is if you had no father. Two, if you had a dysfunctional father. I don't know which is worse. Can I be honest? They're both are pretty rough. Now here's the deal about our society that we live in. The devil is trying to destroy our nation because at its inception it was dedicated to God. This is, was, and will continue to be the Christian nation at our heart. We will be. Because I ain't giving that up. They can't take that from me. But when you watch the news, you watch the media, you watch Hollywood, every movie it seems like right now, uh, the enemy is always the man, and the savior is always the hero of the, as a woman. The leaders of the army are always females. Have you, have you caught them to that? You know, um, uh, the on fire girl. Oh, yeah. Snow was the bad guy, but all the leaders of the little, of the, of, of, of the what do they call them? The sections? What do they call them? The districts were all females. She was a female. The lady who led the rebellion was a female. I'm going to name a movie and I'll show it to you. Seriously, divergent. The, the male roles were the father of four. And he was a bad father. He was an abusive father. All the other leaders were men. No more females. Huh? Well, yeah, okay. Hey, quit being defensive. We'll deal with women later. What I'm saying is, is where are the heroes that are men? Now there are movies out there like that, but I'm saying is there is a thing in our in our culture 
to attack the father, to remove the role of the male in our society. And if you really don't get that, I can't open your eyes to it until one day you wake up and see it. Can I just be honest? I'm not comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, all day long, they won't matter. It's what it is. But here's what I know what the Bible tells me. If the devil can steal the identity of the father, he will then steal the identity of the, the child. If you remove man from society, there's a role that a man has to play as a man, as a father, as a husband. That a woman can't play. Just can't. Now you can argue with me all day long. So if you can steal the identity of the father, steal the identity of the child, you will steal the identity of the heart and soul of our nation. And you will steal God's plan and purposes for mankind. You will. You will. Now, according to the National Commission on Children, these are the latest stats they got available. A home without thought, a father in it, this is their statistics. Five times more likely to commit suicide. Six times more likely to be in a state-operated institution, I mean mental institution. Seven times more likely to drop out of school. Eleven times more likely to commit rape. <coughs> Fifteen times more likely to have behavioral disorders. I ain't bored, don't we? It's higher than that. <coughs> 15 times more likely to end up in prison while a teenager, and 24 times more likely just to run away. In my counseling over the years, I was trying to put a number to it. I'm going to say it's above 90%. I believe it's above 95%. Then every situation we have to deal with where a person is dysfunctional, backwards, self-destructive, hurting their own lives, destroying their own... I guarantee you that at least 90 to 95% of them all go back to something that happened to where they did not feel love, self-worth, they were never safe, they were beat down, they were ignored, they were rejected. It all goes back to something in the family. More specifically, to the role of father play. At least 90 to 95%. There is an epidemic that we're not facing in the church or in America. And the very forces that want to take God out of the government, God out of the school, are the same ones who want to take the role of the male out of the home. So if you think this transgender and the gay situation, or if you take the mom out of the home, you, put two, you lose something. You lose something. Just tell me. Now, Ground zero is the home for everything that is falling apart in America. Not having a father is tragic, but also having a, um, a father who's a tyrant is tragic. Now, when I was growing up, until maybe mm, five, ten years ago, I would have told you I never had a father, and I didn't miss my father. How do you miss what you never had? That was my attitude. I mean, I really didn't hate him. I really didn't hurt for him. I really didn't long for him and I don't get why I didn't. But I didn't. And I would have told you that that doesn't affect me. But somewhere it happened in stages, but somewhere um, the truth came out. God revealed the truth to me. And you know what? It wasn't for him. You know why I'm always angry? No, ain't at my home, are you? I'm quick with Dana. She doesn't say what I need her to say, what I want her to say, or she doesn't understand. I'm quick. And my bitterness comes out. Drew, same thing. If I do something wrong, I don't do it right. I destroy myself. You guys get it? You know what that really is? I never had a father. I was never taught to be a man. I was never taught how to love myself and not destroy myself. Every bit of those dysfunctions go back to what I was never given. 
That's the truth. That's the root. Now I go to counseling, they'll tell me, well, don't talk to the man of that way, say it this way. No, I want it gone. But the ugly truth is, I mean, I'm the pastor. I'm the you pastor all these years. I'm the retired needy guy. I got it all together, baby. Well, most of the time, 99% of the time I do, then there's that 1%. And when that 1% kicks in, you know what? I destroy everything. At least inside of me. Because what I did then opened the door for the devil. See? You ain't who you thought you were. See, you ain't good enough. See, you see, there's no other voice to counter that voice. Nobody ever said, no, Father never said you could be somebody, and I'm proud of you, and I believe in you. Where were with those voices? I've never had them. So what's happening at the gym between me and Michelle and uh, I'm going to beat her and hogtie her and drag her here every Sunday morning to be all that figured. I hope you're watching those people that hogtie her. Uh, It'll be on YouTube. Well, we got a thing there that we say words matter. We talk about it all the time. Words matter. If there's somebody broken, there's somebody who doesn't have a friend, every day it is investing in each other. Every day is building up one another because she never heard it. And what she heard was not good and what I heard was not good. It is an absolute transformational it is more transformational being here honestly because it's one-on-one -on -one. here i'm talking to all of us you need to we need the one-on-one -on -one time to help a lot of times a person go beyond but words matter where am i going with this um i have no problem with jesus you guys got it i was a kid nobody wanted i need you to rescue him right i need somebody to Love me like that. I have no problem with Jesus. Got saved when I was 10. <clears throat> I ran to church because it was love. I was an angry kid. I hated I was angry. What we did, I wouldn't even repeat in church. And then I become loving. But then life got worse than it ever did before. <laughs> but here's the deal. I can relate to Jesus. I can relate to him down on the cross to me. But you telling me God the Father loves me? I get that, but I can't show it to you. I could never show it to you. I couldn't accept him that way because I didn't even know what that looked like. I didn't. If it was for people like David Bridges, Jeremy's mom, I, I wouldn't have known the love, even the love of Jesus. How do you how do I lead us as a church to where, where the, the lens comes off, the, the mask comes off, to where we can absolutely see God the Father as God the Father? <coughs> now, people say, well, you know what? You don't really need a, you don't really need a man in a home. That's true. God will make a way for you to make it. Maybe he'll send somebody. That's why we got to be a church that brings these kids in here, these teenagers, and invest in them and build in them because they don't have it. Nobody ever said that the, the father in the home, you know, in that person's life had to be. We can do this. We can save a generation because two generations, to my my way of measuring generations, in 20 year inference, have been lost. Seriously. But we can do something about that. But there's things, Shelly would tell you, there's things that I, no matter how hard I tried, I could not put those into my kids. If you've never, as a, I'm gonna tell you as a, as a, as a man. Oh man, I'm gonna stick my nose We'll be here all day. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this: if you didn't have a father, whether he left you, he died on you, he walked away, no matter what it was, I guarantee you, as a young man, you won't love more than anything in this world. when you don't understand love. And even if you're given real love, you will think it's against you. You will think it's not love. If you, most marriages end not because there wasn't love. It ends because we can't comprehend love. We can't understand love. And if we can't comprehend love in the flesh, seriously, you think you can comprehend love in the spirit? But when we comprehend love in the spirit, then that changes the physical part. And 
Right. So how much does God the Father love us? Put up there. For God has loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God so loved us and valued us that he was willing. You ever seen? He was willingly, he willingly and he purposely sacrificed his own child he dearly loved. Those are words. But the day you really connect with that, man, it will bring you to your knees. See, that's the greatest love that's ever been given. But how do you process a love like that when there's no way to process it? But I had no dad. My dad rejected me. My family rejected me. Everybody walked out on me. My dad died. My dad was a tyrant. My dad was evil. <laughs> Most of us grow up and become adults in the generation we're living. We haven't figured it out. We haven't got the answers. We haven't healed. But now we're fathers. Most of us, if you grew up in a family where these dynamics were at play, you're actually a captive. A captive. Most of those kids who grow up in the environment can't love. So they are they check out emotionally. They say they're an introvert. They don't even know who they are. They don't even know who they are. Honey, you, you haven't never connected with God the Father's love like that because what's happened in your life? How do you know who you are? You may be hopper and more crazier than Shelly. <laughs> but until you reconnect that emotion, the emotion. Don't hide behind the spirit, baby, because sometimes we do in church. We get holy, we hide behind the spirit. Oh, that's below me. That's not me. You want to bet? <laughs> when there's no emotion between you and God the Father, there's something that's broken. Now, when I say you become a captive by it, what am I talking about? What, the, what you were denied is what holds you captive. <coughs> you to say What you were denied, and these are the things, security, Approval. I've seen more men today, not necessarily right here in this immediate group, more men because they don't measure up to their dad and their dad's still alive and they're still in dad's shadow. These are 55-year-old men. These are people who retired from the military and they were officers. These are people that are judges and lawyers. They have the best in life. They have the best homes. They got it all, but they still live in the shadow of their dad who's 80 years old and they never measured up. And so now, all of a sudden, their family has fallen apart and the grandkids are now out and now they're adults. Now they're having babies. So you got three generations of dysfunction because nobody broke the chain. Nobody was willing to get on their knees and go, I don't care if I was hurt, rejected, I don't care if I measure up to my den, what matters if I measure up to God and get on your knees and make it right with God. Maybe not in an altar, maybe it's, maybe it's by your bed, maybe it's in the middle of your floor, maybe it's at the freaking lake. I don't care where it happens, but it has to happen. But Jeff, am I not saved? Yeah, you're saved. But what good is being saved if you're still a captain? You're still a slave. You don't have to be from a broken, completely broken family and the father walked out on you to never measure up to your dad. What is missing security? Approval. Self-worth. And the emotions. The emotions to love or to be loved. <laughs> mm. Put it up here. A Catholic is not having a father. Jeff, not having a father was and is the single greatest issue of my life. I never knew it. I never knew it. Not to be everybody else's father. Boy, I had a hard time being a father of my own kid. Nothing can replace the defining power of a father's voice and touch. If your father's here, or you're in a father role, or if you're just a friend of a, of a lady who doesn't have a, a, a... If you're a male in this room and you're a Christian... You need to be building up people, even if you don't even know them. And touch, it matters. The hug matters. You know how a kid gets, oh, stop it out. Be tough. Stop crying. Men don't hug. You are absolutely destroying that kid. That kid 
needs to be held and loved and not just by the mother. So I love watching Matt. Matt's always hugging on that kid. He's always loving that kid. In fact, when I get online, I never see tweets from anybody in this group but him. <laughs> and I guarantee you, it, it's got something to do with his son. That or get a new car. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, it's always about the car. He, he ain't set up that thing. But here's the deal. Nothing can face the, the defining power of the Father's voice and touch. And you know what else? On a spiritual level, I can't preach to you good enough to where you will feel and hear God's voice. <clears throat> But he wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to feel his touch. But I can't preach it into you. It's got to be between you and him. Mm -hmm. To have the voice of a father speak into the life of a child, it is a game changer. You know, I, I, my father never spoke anything in my life. I can't remember a single word he ever spoke to me. I only saw him that one year I lived with him, and we never saw him. I do not remember a single word he said to me. I was too young. Father's voice saying, I, I love you. I believe in you. I'm proud of you. Oh my goodness. What I heard was, you're nothing. This is from my mom. You're nothing. You're nobody. Wish you were never born. I should not be standing here today. But God's love is real. God's love put dead bridges in my life. The Lord's paradise in my life. God's love made a way for me to make something of myself. But I didn't know that was God's love when it was happening. And everything I do in this group is try to open our eyes to see God and to see Jesus in love and spirit. An intimate relationship. Because the first thing you do when you're hurt, especially by a dad or a mom, is you don't know how to process emotion. You just don't. That's why I hug. That's why I pat you on the back. That's why, I, you know, if you let me, I do these things. Sometimes people put a wall up. You know, you try to fight through them, but, you know, you kind of push until, you know, you can't push no more. Why do you say the things you say, the emails or the letters, the texts here and there? If you let me, I'll speak truth into your life. But sometimes it does, sometimes I feel like a person who's bitter, all you sometimes what you do is you cause more harm than good sometimes. But if I'm gonna err on one side, you know where I'm gonna err, right? I really do expect the leaders in this group, whatever here, you better love the people that are under you. And you better lay down your life for them, and you better fight for them. And you better make them feel loved and accepted, and at the same time, challenge them. <clears throat> Just because your love and Father doesn't give us the right to sin and destroy ourselves. But because the Father loves us, because Jesus loves us, because He died for us, then we're, <clears throat> then we're to stand. And God will challenge us. So the times you might be upset with me with something I said, by the way, Shelly kind of sees it, and some of y'all, I don't even see it. They start to say things, she sees the, the reaction to it. You're not happy with what I said. If I love you, I'm going to say it. Now, at the end of the day, God's got to do what only God can do, and He can only do it in the Spirit. If all you do is run to your flesh, run to your anger, run to what was done to you, and why people don't love you, why no one gets you, why, why people don't understand your love languages, or people don't understand what you need or what you're saying, I can guarantee you, they're not the one broken. But we're too blind to see that. We try to model the right things right for us. We try to hug them, right? You bring them to the altar, right? You put the right things in them. But then God has to do what only God can do at the end of the day, in the Spirit. God is not your enemy. You know what? Your dad or the person that should have been your dad or whatever isn't your enemy. You know who the enemy really is? It's the devil. He destroyed your father. Probably destroyed his father's father. And he's destroying you. And he's going to destroy your kids right now. And you think it won't happen to you and your kids. 
No, he will. Unless you're willing to, to absolutely let God do in you to open your eyes, to open your ears, to heal, to transform what's there. The biggest lie the devil ever tell you is, that's not me. I don't need that. I don't need that. Now, that being said, I want to give us an example of a father. And uh, because I want to show you what I think, this is the best example I can shoot if I find of a father that I would want us to be. The father I want to have. The father I want to be. The father I want to see Dave be. By the way, Dave's a father to a bunch of women his age. <laughs> no, no, no. No, he gets it. The Bible has a term for that. It's called a shepherd. I come at you as a pastor, but 99 times out of 100, I come at you as a father too, or a brother, or a friend, or a counselor. Watch this, because this is absolutely beautiful. This is from America's Got Talent. Today, shall I hear the, that song, you know, Shake the Ground? Yeah. yeah, he's a Christian. So what, they, what he didn't tell them yet, <laughs> they know now, is he's a very, very freaking good, good very Christian music artist. He is a worship leader in his church. But he knew he went in and said all this, it would be against him. But anyway, dude, he is a Christian. He does sing Christian music. Uh, uh, some of you, I've sent you songs of his all week long. Ten of you texted me after church. I downloaded this song. I downloaded this song. I downloaded this song. And th so the thing is, is, dude, it's good to have a, you know, a guy who sh has that kind of love, but it's a godly love. You know, it's beautiful. Ah! That being said, um, you might hear another one of his songs later. The last thing I want to close with here. Last thing I want to close with before I hand this over to them. Put up, Jeremy. The song, You'll Never Know Just the Way That I Love You. That is God's heart to you. That's right. Yes. Even if you can't process that, you can't relate to that, you don't understand that, that is his song to you. The psyche quote is from Michael who says, when you're surviving, you can't dream. Y'all ask me all day long, what's my purpose? I can't tell you your purpose until you heal. When you're surviving, you can't dream. Let God finish what he started in you because that is his promise. Let God heal it. Let God restore those emotional bonds, those spiritual. Let it happen. You want to dream? Let it happen. You want to know why you're at a roadblock? You know why you can't go no further? You can't punch your way? You can't force your way? You can't make it happen? It ain't coming? God says, this next step, if you don't get this step right, you're not having that step because I'm not going to do that. Because you will pass on the dysfunction and never even know what you're doing. That being said, do we uh, have to live in that bondage, in that captivity, in exile? No. <coughs> this is right to the Israelites. This is what the Israelites actually said. Psalms 126, 1 through 3. Then the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, to Jerusalem. Basically brought them back home. We were like men who <laughs> we are we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Where is your joy? Where is the joy when you worship and there's no joy, no passion, no fire? It's because you haven't been set free. You might be saved, but have you been healed? And when they were healed and set free, the joy came back. The passion came back. The fire came out. I don't know who's got it from here, but I'll turn it over to Shelly and Dave. I didn't mean to take someone there.
you have those moments when there's just something in your life that you hold on to, you connect with, and in the midst of battles or in the midst of things, there's something that you grab hold of. Um, many years ago, you guys, most of you know my backstory. You know all of the stuff that I've been through. Um, with all the, the sexual abuse and all of the things that have been there my whole life and how things were really bad. The last four or five years has just been a journey. It's been an absolute process. God has shown me this process of healing, of release, of being there. But through there, years ago, this book, I found this book. Um, and it was funny because I ran to the beach every time I needed, I was hurt. I was broken because I could put my feet in the sand. I could put my hands in the sand. Sorry, y'all, I'm gonna probably cry through this, but I'm sorry. I would put my hands in the sand. I could feel the water and I knew God was right there. I knew that he heard me. I knew Amen. that he saw me. I knew that he felt me in his power, his overwhelming peace, his strength, his power filled me. And I was like, I can find another day. Because I always ran to the beach when I needed that. God, I need you. I can't tell you how many times I literally walked the beach. You know, those from the shoals. And one day, a long time ago, I was at the beach. I was having some of those broken times. I think the kids were gone. And I was there by myself. And I don't even remember the person's name. I don't remember their home. I don't remember anything about them except going into their bathroom and their bedroom while this book on the nightstand. I was like, what is that? She's like, oh, you need to read it. I picked it up and I read it. Now, y'all, I don't read books. I'm not a reader. I had more now than I was then. And I cried. I mean, like, ugly cry. All the way through it. All the way through it. And it was like, me. And then I laughed. And I was like, I wanted the book. She's like, you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and so in 2006, my mom actually found the book. I couldn't remember the name of it. I couldn't remember anything about it. I just knew it was shells and it was impactful. It was everything. Um, so this morning, this book has been something that I pick up and I read. And I read it. And I've read it. And I've read it. It's been like a life book. And um, I hadn't actually opened up and read this to anyone else. And nobody gets this book because this is that we do have something to share. But, Anyway, this book is important. Well, I was on the phone with Dave, and for some reason I felt like I need to read this book to him. What is that? So I read it. And today is about what he did in this bag um, and the journey, a little bit of the journey. I'm going to read, actually, I'm going to read the book to you guys, and if I cry, you can cry with me, okay? <laughs> but, um, book is called My Beautiful Broken Shell. And I'm just going to read to you what has given me such a lifeline and such a hope and a connection. Dawn has broken on a beautiful day here at the ocean. I've come to refresh my weary spirit and to reveal my tired soul. I'm so grateful for the peace and the calm of the seashore where time stands still and I'm rushed, where I can see and feel the beauty all around me. This is my first morning at the ocean, and as I walk to the beach, feeling the rich, warm sand beneath my feet, I decide to collect a few shells. It is low tide, and I watch mesmerized as the ocean rises slowly, curls, and then spills its white lace foam onto the shore. I walk by a broken scallop shell and leave it to search for more perfect ones. But then I stop. I go back and I pick up the broken shell. I realize that this shell is me with my broken heart. This shell is people who are hurting, people who have lost loved ones, people who are frightened or alone, people with unfulfilled dreams. This shell has had to fight so hard to keep from being totally crushed by the pounding surf, just as I have had to do. Yet this shell is still out on the beautiful sandy shore, just as I am. 
Thank you, Lord, that I haven't been completely crushed by the heaviness in my heart, by the pounding of the surf. If our world were only filled with perfect shells, we would miss some of life's most important lessons along the way. We would never learn from adversity, from pain, from sorrow. Thank you, Lord, for all that I've learned from my brokenness, for the courage it takes to live with my pain, and for the strength it takes to remain on the shore. Broken shells teach us not to look at our imperfections, but to look at the beauty, the great beauty of what is left. If anything is still left of me or my loved ones, then that is enough to grab hold of, to keep me going, to thank God for. Broken shells mean lots of tears, lots of pain, lots of struggle, but they are also valuable for teaching faith, courage, and strength. Broken shells inspire others and demonstrate the will to go on in a way that no perfect shell could ever do. Broken shells are shells that have been tested and tried and hurt, yet they don't quit. They continue to be. Thank you, Lord, for the great strength it takes to simply be. When I hurt so deeply that there seems to be nothing left of me. As I walk along the beach picking up shells, I see that each one has its own special beauty, its own unique pattern. Lord, help me to see my own beautiful pattern and to remember that each line and each color on my shell was put there by you. Help me not to compare myself to others so that I may appreciate my own uniqueness. Help me to truly accept myself just as I am so that I may sing the song in my heart for no one else has my song to sing, my gift to give. I watch the rolling surf toss new shells onto the shore and I'm reminded of the many times that I too have been tossed by the storms of life and worn down by the sands of time, just like my beautiful broken shell but I'm reminded that broken shells, they don't stand alone. Thank you, Lord, for being with me to share my life, to help me carry my burdens. Thank you for the precious gift of faith that keeps me strong when I'm weak, that keeps me going when it would be easier to quit. Thank you, Lord, for hope in times of despair, for light in times of darkness, for patience in times of suffering, for assuring me that with you, all things are possible. A wave crashes, sending tiny sand crabs hurrying for safety, and I am reminded <coughs> that the smallest creature depends on each other. Especially in our brokenness, we need the Lord, and we need each other. Thank you, Lord, for filling my life with people who care. Thank you for my family, for my friends, for those who are always there for me. As I look at my beautiful broken shell, I see that it has nothing to hide. It doesn't pretend to be perfect or whole. Its brokenness is clear for everyone to see. Lord, may I be strong enough to show my pain and brokenness like this shell. May I give myself permission to hurt, to cry, to be human. May I have the courage to risk sharing my feelings with others so that I may receive support and encouragement along the way. Lord, help me to reach out to others, especially to the broken and discouraged, not only to love them, but to learn from them as well. May I listen, comfort, and give unconditional love to all who pass my way. Lord, help me realize that I am not the only one hurting, that we all have pains in our lives, Help me remember that in my brokenness, I am still whole and complete in your sight. Amen. As I walk along the many washed up shells, I suddenly spot a broken conch shell, white and ordinary on the outside, yet brilliant coral inside. Lord, help me see inside the hearts of the people who touch my life and to see their true colors. Somehow, here at the ocean, I receive so many gifts I'm grateful for the inner peace that fills my soul. I take time to notice sandpipers playing along the shore, beach grasses swaying in the salty breezes, 
I delighted by many simple treasures, a, smooth, a piece of smooth green glass polished by the waves, a transparent white stone, a starfish. Lord, help me to remain childlike in my appreciation of life. Please slow me down that I may always see the extraordinary in the ordinary, that I may always wonder at the shell in the sand, the dawn of a new day, the beauty of a flower, the blessing of a friend, the love of a child. And my brokenness, may I, ever, may I never take life so seriously that I forget to laugh along the way. May I always take the time to watch a kite dance in the sky, to sing, to pick daisies, to love, to take risks, to believe in my dreams. As I look once more at the broken scallop shell in my hand, I am reminded of all the beautiful shells God has placed around me. Lord, may I truly value every moment spent with my loved ones while this life is so briefly mine. Let me not destroy the beauty of today by grieving Amen. over yesterday Amen. or worrying about tomorrow. Amen. May I cherish and appreciate my shell collection each and every day, for I know not when the tide will come and wash my treasures away. Thank you, Lord, for embracing my shell, whether I'm whole or broken. Thank you for sending me loved ones who care. Thank you for holding me in the palm of your hand, for keeping me safe from the pounding surf. For now, I'll just continue walking and adding to my collection of beautiful shells. This book says a lot to me. I don't know if it connected some stuff in there, but even a father, wounds, wounds come from all kinds of places, all different areas. But I read this today, but he doesn't say a whole lot. He just says, and I'll come back to a few things, but he just says, send me a picture of what it, the cover looks like. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, it's a scallop shell. And so he comes in and he hands me this bag and where I can't get through that without crying, I'm going to turn that over to him. Because <laughs> <laughs> I cry a lot. First of all, it was an honor that she read it to me because I also saw myself, I saw Shelly in this whole story. I also saw myself because I'm the father of three children and the first child I never held in my hands was a miscarriage. And yet, but I know one day, or I can read in heaven that child will know me as dad and I will know that my child and we'll have eternity together. And that day is coming. I'm also the dad of twin girls. You'll be 30 on July 19th of this year. But back in 2005, I went through kind of a nasty divorce and I remember sitting in my lawyer's office and he says, what do you want? He said, I want two things. He said, I want the girls and I to go through counseling to deal with any issues. And I want a copy of the pictures. I mean, I want the original so I can go get pictures made of the girls at the various stages of their life. And he says, you sure that's all you want? I said, that's all I want. They were my life. And since it was kind of a clean divorce, we really didn't get tested anything. We went through the process real quickly. And within a week after I the divorce is finalized. I get a notice. I had two certified letters waiting for me at the post office. I went to the post office, picked them up, out of my truck, and I sat there and I opened up the first letter. And it broke me just like a shell. It broke the piece off. Opened up the next letter, and it broke, the shell broke again. My heart broke. Another piece of the shell was broken. They said, Dad, we don't want nothing to do with you. I went to my lawyer and my lawyer, I asked my lawyer, what do I do now? I want this counseling. I want to deal with any issues. He says, well, you have to take them to court. How can you take your own children to court? So I made the choice and I honored their request and I stepped out of the lives. What I didn't realize was that God was actually orchestrating a lot of things behind the scenes. I tried, the pictures are still being put together I remember three months after all this happened, I was working. I still remember where I was. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to restore the years lost. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I don't tell the story a lot, because most people go, yeah, when you get to heaven, but no, it's going to happen here. Amen. 
And I held on to the promises because his promises are yes and amen. He said yes, and I said amen to it. And I held on to that promise all these years. And it was interesting because the pieces are still coming together of what God was trying to do within me to bring me to the point where restoration could happen between the girls and I. I was talking to Michelle at the gym. She knows about the situation. Her story is somewhat similar, but different. And I realized when we were talking that it was by God's grace we didn't go through counseling. Because, because I was bitter and angry at my wife, I would have destroyed their mom in front of me. It was by his grace. I didn't see it until all these years. That's right. That's right. But he was orchestrated. He kept that. That's, That's right. the Father's love to me. He preserved me. Amen. I mean, love covers them all to do his sins. It wasn't Amen. just her. It was also me. But yet, he protected the children. And back on May 15th of this year, I was spending time with the Father, and the Father says, you know how powerful love is. And I went through my process of thinking about the Bible, different stories. And I actually had to be honest with him. I said, no. The word power sort of tripped me up. I didn't know what he was trying to say to me. I said, well, teach me. And when you're honest and sincere with God, and when you say, teach me, he doesn't waste any time. See, I know what happened between the girls and I. Did you show John 10.10? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the thief is doing. The, the enemy came in and destroyed us, the girls and I. But I love the part that says, but I have come to give you life and have it more abundantly. And see, he gave me life during this whole process, but now I, I'm seeing where I'm getting close to the abundant life with him. Because I realize there's a difference in love. There's a worldly love, which always comes from the mind, our faults. There's also the love that rises up within your spirit. And now I'm seeing the distinction when I talk to people. There's a difference between just looking and trying to love them through my mind and processing the that way situations. There's a difference when it comes up from the spirit because Amen. it is him working through me. Amen. And, and that's where the process I am on right now, understanding that and understanding his love for me because I know when I understand the Father's love, when I see my Father as he sees me, then I will know the restoration of the girls and I will have Because I believe the Father didn't want the girls to see me through the love of the world that I had. He wants them to see me through the love of the Father, my Father in heaven. Amen. You have a picture of the broken shell? So it was interesting, the thing behind this story is, I went to a shell shop to look for this shell. And I realized as I walked through the shell, the store that you're not gonna find a broken shell if they wanna sell in a store like this. That's right. That's right. And see, I walked through the aisles and I remember her saying, is there anything I can help you find myself? See, I know it when I see it. And I walked through the aisles one by one and I'm, it's always interesting, on the last aisle, halfway down, there it was. But it wasn't broken, it was nice and complete and whole. And then I saw another shell next to it, and not debating, do I get the small one or the larger one? And the Holy Spirit says, buy both. Okay, I did it. And I went home, and I had to recreate the broken shell. But when I checked out at the pay for these shelves, the gal says, I don't wrap these shells because these shells are very hard. They're very hard to break. A lot of restaurants will use them to help in the serving process of various foods. And, and I realized that it was hard. I took a tool to it. It was hard. <laughs> took another tool and finally ended up with just a hacksaw blade, metal blade, cutting it, and all of a sudden a piece broke off. And I go, OK, I still have a larger shell. I mean, that's what God wanted me to know <laughs> ahead of time. But he said, no, move we'll back, back together because I'm the one that brings healing to you. And when I did all this, I wrote something to Shelly. Do you have the one with the, the small shell? Show the shell. Yeah, open the bag. And he, he gives me direction. He says, 
says pull out a small shell first. And it was in there. Here, hold it. It's okay. And so he pulls this out, y'all. And I'm, I'm crying. I, I'm here in church, and I'm like, and I start crying because I looked for this shell on the beach for years. And like he said, this one's hard. And you find these old on the beach. You rarely see them broken. See, when I wrote to Shelley, I said, the small shell represents your past, a broken spirit, damaged and defective, being down by life, crushed by others, shattered by the circumstances out of your control, and disregarded by many as invaluable. Pieced back together by the love of the Father. I'm also was pieced back together. And, but now I recreated the small shell, and it's like, okay, what's the larger shell for? Is that for somebody else? And he said, no, that's how I see you. I don't see you as broken anymore. Want to show about the larger shell? And it was interesting that this was the larger one because the larger shell, your larger, he is larger than any problems or situation in your life, the brokenness in your life. Mm -hmm. And what he's been teaching me in the last couple weeks is this is how he sees me. He doesn't see the brokenness in me. He doesn't see the struggles I have with the girls not being in my life anymore because he sees me as whole and complete. He says, You need to see you as I see you. Amen. And and I wrote this to Shelly. It says, the big shell is the one, is who you have become through his love. He sees you as beautiful, complete in him, free from the past, free from the scars, free from the brokenness, free from the wounds of life, free from the desires of the past, and free from the inadequacies of life. You are complete in him. His love for you is pure, respectful, obsessive, and passionate for you. The Father wants to reveal Bring to light his love in you so you can see yourself as the Father sees you. He wants you to know just how much he loves you. The originator of love loves you. The Father that you can depend on, rely on, and even relax in his presence. Love has given you a purpose, the wholeness. Love is, will guide you as you run your race. So love beyond measures and words. Take hold of his love. That's all he wants me to see him. You see, what I know when I get to this point of understanding this fullness of his love within me, I will be reunited with my girls once again. I know that day is getting closer. You know, it's interesting. Luke 9, 23, I don't think you have this. It says, and he said to all, if any person will come after me, let him deny himself disown himself, forget, lose sight of himself and his own interests, refuse to give up his himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also. I really believe that scripture all, is all about love. What's your, what's your cross that you got to take up? You can respond by the world, or you can respond by his love in everything you do. Because he is love. We are to be his example in everything we do. <clears throat> I went up to Dollar Tree last week and was just kind of wanted to be in there quick and out. Be in there quick. And got three items, second in line to check out. And she starts ringing me up. And she says that would be five dollars. And she realized she made a mistake because it should have been just three dollars. And as I sat there, well, I stood there. Watching her right on the register, she's panicking, she's frustrated, she's punching all these buttons. And I knew, I know their system, and I knew she was just making a bigger mess of the situation. Hello. People in the line was starting to get longer and longer. The frustration and anxiety was coming up within the people. She kept apologizing to me. I said, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. You know, but see, I had a choice. I could approach her with the love of the world and just ridicule her. And Yep. Broke her even more, frustrated her even more, yep. but I had a choice. Yep. And what hit me was that how can I be mad and upset with her because she's still God's child, whether she is saved or not. 
She's still his child. And if really, in all reality, if I come against her, out of my frustration and all that, it's also a representation of how I view my father in heaven. And I gotta stand before him one day. And I want to know his love to his fullness. And that's what I'm going through right now. The power of his love. For me, for me to be able to stand up here today, I was the introvert. I was the one that would sit in the back row of the church. In fact, I remember the first three or four Sundays that I came. I think Jeff saw this. I would drive by the church, it was 15 to 10, and I would drive by, and I would go down and sit in the parking lot, wait till it was 5 to 10, thinking I got three more minutes to get back to church. I could slip in the bath. And it wasn't that you didn't do anything because all you guys did was love me and accept me for who I am. Amen. But I had to get beyond that point of seeing his love in me. And all of a sudden, all of this in, um, the inability to stop, to, uh, to talk in front of people, by his power of his love, he started changing me. And I started seeing people differently. I started seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. You know, I really believe when Jesus was in the garden and he sweat, drops of blood, he knew what was before him. Yes, we all understand that. But I also believe even more than that was the drops of blood was he knew for a brief period of time he'd have to be separated from the love of the Father. And it broke him. And his body reacted to that brokenness. You know, I just believe with all my heart that it's not about me, it's not about Shelly, it's not Amen. even about Jeff. Amen. It's not about anyone in this room, really, because it's all about the one who lives within you. Amen. And when you get to that point where he becomes dominant in your life, Amen. and your actions, and your words, and your thoughts, yes. that's when the power of love can make you yes. make things happen, make things happen. Yes. And you don't think you cannot do it. <clears throat> happen. Yes. You can't make it all happen. Amen. We try in our own flesh to make things happen, but we can't make it happen. That's right. That makes it happen. That's us. right. It's that dependency on that love. See, Shelly and I, we talked about love, and it was like a different perspective because I had a pretty good father growing up. And I could relate to the Father's love more, the Heavenly Father's love more. And But I had a hard time showing that love to other people. And Shelly was just the opposite. She could show the love to other people. Because mm -hmm. not, I love people. But because of what a father has been in my life, which is either nothing or abusive or bad, I have no clue how to relate to him as a father. Yes. Because a father was just... I didn't want to relate him as a father because I couldn't. I just couldn't. Because I didn't want to see God in the light that I saw as a father. When I thought of a father, it was ugly, and I did not want to see God in that ugliness. And I couldn't understand it. And so, and it was funny because we both at the same time kind of went on this journey of different love. But I said, Lord, let me see you. Let me feel your love. Mm. Lord, not let me feel it. Lord, let me accept your love. Amen. Let me trust him. Amen. Your love for me. Amen. Let me see, feel you as the Father that Amen. I have so not been able to do. And these little things happen where I'm sitting there and I just I feel his love on me. And there's nothing more powerful. And the more I do, I'm like, Lord, thank you for being my father. Yes. And he's showing me yes. what the father really is. That love and that the beautifulness. And that rolls into this that I have to share. This is um, something I'm dealing with right now, y'all. I've been through a lot and I've grown a lot, but I'm nowhere near perfect. I don't know that I ever will be perfect. But something that Dave said in there was a perfect plaza. Father, since he's given this to me, this broken shell's been out. Amen. Because I know how to relate to this. Amen. This is what I understand. That's right. Right? This is That's my right. past. This is what I've been through. This That's is what I've right. heard. This is what it is. I see it broken. That's right. This is the first day it's been in my hands more than this much time. It's been in my hands more right now that it's been since he gave it to me. 
As a matter of fact, it's remained wrapped and hidden. And in the back, I haven't been able to take it out of the back. There's something behind that, right? That's right. Because I don't see myself as a pro. Yes, I do. I see so many things that I'm like, oh, I didn't handle that like that. Or this happened. And, and another thing I told him at, at Jeff's house was, David doesn't have scars on it. It's perfect. But I have scars. But something I've learned, those are beautiful scars. Those are scars of what I've been through, scars of where I've been, things I've gone through, things I've faced, things that I have made bad choices and then come back. There are scars and scars, but they're not open wounds. They're not gushing. They're peeled back together. Amen. And when he told me he had to glue that back and then create the scar, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. Not just for him, but you can see the crack where it broke. I looked for that. You can see the crack where it broke, so he didn't get it back perfect. So the broken shell has a scar. Not only is it broken, but it has a scar of healing leading to the brokenness. And today, as I'm learning the love of the Father, I realized today that I still hold on to things against fathers in my life, and I'm just going to share that out before everybody. And when I'm back there, I uh, I pray for God to let me be vulnerable today. Yeah. And uh, there are things that fathers in abandonment that have done, but not only that, there's anger towards their fathers because they were abandoned. But I've held on to that, and today's a new day. Amen. I'm tired of letting Father's Day be a day that I have upset. Amen. I'm tired of letting Father's Day be something I dread. I'm tired Amen. of letting Father's Day hurt me. Amen. Because I'm the one doing it. I'm choosing to hold on to that. Amen. I'm choosing to allow them to do that. Amen. And just like God showed me, I heal this, and I heal that, and I heal this. Should I already hold on to it? Amen. Why aren't we all hold on to it? Amen. I know there's some of us sitting in here today, and we hold that. And it might not just be for the Father, but we hold it. But I know this day, like you said, is the worst day. But why? Why is it the worst day? When the love of the Father that I never knew is so strong and so Amen. powerful Amen. and so free. And the funny thing is, all I had to do was ask. Amen. All I had to do was and he does. He does. I expected it. I believed it. Because his word says he hears me and he answers That's me. That's right. And he has. Today, I'll be the first one down here. Because today is the day the father, anger, hurt, pain, is put into his hands. I am done. Amen. This is not a bad day. Amen. This is a blessing because the father has restored <coughs> and renewed and changed me. Amen. And my prayer is that I hold that shell and say, because I know that you love me. And I am whole in right. your sight. That's right. Not that I'm perfect, but I am whole. That's right. And when God opens up brokenness, it's time to shut the door and close it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a song by the same person. <laughs> and um, Jeff said it to me. I know this is Jay. He sent me several, but he knew this one would be my favorite. And it's called Spirit Lead Me. And it's very powerful. But one thing it says, I'm not going to let my emotions, I don't, I don't know how it's exactly worded, but it says that basically it's not about emotions. Not about it's feelings. about the spirit. It's not about your feelings. It's not about your emotions. <laughs> Today, laying it down, if you come up here with me and lay this down, if you choose to do so, it's not about your emotional pull because of a book or that it's God. It's the spirit. And when the spirit comes forward and you lay it down, when God Amen. says it's finished, it's done. Amen. And you are free. Yes. And who is free in the Lord is free indeed. Right. And that bondage doesn't hold in areas of our lives. We are free. Right. I want to play this song. And I want to give everybody an opportunity to come forth and lay this down. 
Don't walk out of here on a bad day. Don't walk in as a bad day or walk out as a bad day. Walk out of the joy and the love of the Lord. Amen. And also, I have confidence in this promise and visit you in the world. I need to pull that table back there for her. Here's your drums. Thank you. <laughs>